my great pleasure that I get to introduce Dr. Ethan Miller. Our next speaker, Dr. Miller, is an assistant professor in the Department of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at the University of Texas MD Anderson Center. He was a congressional aide in the U.S. House Committee on Banking, Finance, and Urban Affairs in Washington, D.C. in 93 and 94, so he really does understand our advocacy. He got his B.A. in Philosophy from WashU as well as his M.A. in Psychology, was a research assistant in molecular genetics department of pathology for Baylor College of Medicine, where he also earned his medical degree in 04. He completed his internal medicine residency training and joined MD Anderson in 2010 after completing his gastroenterology fellowship at Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. He is the assistant professor, Department of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, Division of Internal Medicine, the University of Texas MD Anderson Center, Houston, Texas, 2010 to present. One of the unique things that I am thrilled to be able to say Dr. Miller did was I was connected with him with the General Faculty Speakers Bureau with MD Anderson. When I explained to him what we were doing, why we were doing it, his response to me immediately was, how can I help? Who else do you need? What slots can I help you fill to make sure that all the attendees get some of the best speakers possible? So it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Ethan Miller. Hi, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. Um, uh, it's. Uh, it's hard to follow Dr. Vierling. Um, you've had the uh, honor of, of uh, hearing from one of the absolute world experts in not only uh, PBC, but autoimmune disease of the liver in general. So um, some of these things that I'm going to say you may have heard before, but I, I think that they're important things to hear. And the way I kind of designed what I was going to say is out of talking to patients, uh, usually the first visit where we're either discussing a new diagnosis of PBC or contemplating how to begin treatment. So I wanted to make this in sort of a, a very kind of question and answer kind of format. So PBC, uh, as has been said, is considered to be an autoimmune disease and it's from impaired flow of bile through the liver. Um, bile accumulates, leads to progressive destruction of small bile ducts and it can lead to cirrhosis and, and liver failure if not treated. But as you've heard and as I wanna just emphasize again, even if uh, one does develop cirrhosis, that doesn't necessarily, it's not an endpoint. It's just uh, um, a, uh, a, a condition that in many cases can be managed and not necessarily is going to be something that is life limiting. Uh, so what is bile? Bile is a, a complex substance that is a fluid that is comprised of waste products from the body uh, containing cholesterol metabolites and cholesterol type molecules and drug molecules, a lot of uh, Drugs are processed through the liver and uh, are excreted through bile. Um, it's important for intestinal absorption of fat and fat dissolved particles. It's stored for release during a meal in the gallbladder. It's produced by flow through the liver uh, and it's recycled through the small intestine and colon as Dr. Veerling also alluded to. Uh, so why does PBC happen? Uh, probably a combination of uh, genetics and other factors. It can be passed on to children uh, 1.2 incidents uh, in children of an affected parent. I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Um, there's some indication that there may be some correlation with environmental factors, but nothing has really shown that there's any cause, causal connection between these different factors. Things like smoking, exposure to industrial chemicals, even infections. But the bottom line is that the cause isn't really known. Uh, and so when is PBC suspected? Usually it's discovered Ultimately, after uh, there are uh, incidentally identified abnormalities on just lab tests that you might get when you go for a physical, and as you well know, this has mainly to do with the alkaline phosphatase or bilirubin. Uh, it can be um, explored in the course of being evaluated or treated for other autoimmune diseases or based upon symptoms. Um, and so symptoms that uh, are, again, uh, 
suspicious for, auto, uh, for PBC include fatigue, uh, itching skin, particularly if it's worse at night, uh, yellowing the skin or jaundice, abdominal pain or swelling or weight loss. And what you notice about this is these are all just so nonspecific. And I know that uh, many people, uh, many of us may have gone on with, without any kind of diagnosis on, online and you may pop up a panel of symptoms that you have and it will tell you you, you must have this disease. And I, I think that, um, that we want to try and assign names to things and, and develop patterns for the symptoms that we have. Um, and so, um, but these are just sort of the general clues that somebody might have PBC. Um, but real diagnosis requires performing blood tests, um, and you want to rule out other diseases. You want to make sure that there's not also viral infections, and, and just because you have PBC doesn't mean you don't necessarily have the other diseases. Um, your doctor will test for uh, inherited or other metabolic diseases, and certainly autoimmune diseases. Um, and so, um, the other part of a diagnosis of PBC, as you all know, or, or hopefully it's been done, is that you have, to, you have to have some sort of imaging to make sure that the elevated alkaline phosphatase, or bilirubin, is not the result of some problem with your bile duct, that there's no blockage in your bile duct. Um, and that needs to happen uh, for everybody. Hopefully everybody who's been diagnosed with PBC, that was part of their initial evaluation. Um, it's not to say that you can't also have those conditions. I think we're going to hear later for some conditions where it's sort of a gray area. Um, and the essential part of the diagnosis is a positive antimitochondrial antibody. Um, it, it is present in about 5% uh, of uh, normal patients, but uh, it's usually present in about 95% if you're affected. Uh, I'm sorry, 1%. So, so I think there was a question earlier uh, that Dr. Veerling addressed that it is possible to have an elevated antimitochondrial antibody and not actually have uh, PBC. Um, a liver biopsy is not usually done um, because the other tests are so good. Um, but it can be useful if PBC is still the suspicion, but there is not an elevated antimitochondrial antibody. And it also can be useful if there's questions as to how severe the liver injury is, even if it is known that you have PBC. Um, and I was speaking to someone earlier about the question of, well, if, if I get a biopsy, um, should I have repeat biopsies later on? Um, and and that's, that's sort of a case-by-case -case issue. Uh, my general feeling is that you really don't need a biopsy unless it's going to answer specific questions or change the management in a very specific way. Because like any test in medicine, especially an invasive test, there are risks. And although the risks are rare, you don't want to then have one of these complications and then look back and say, well, gosh, did we really need to have that done? Um, so hopefully whoever's caring for you kind of goes through that, process, that thought process and only uh, does test that they think are really going to change what happens to you or how they're treating you. Um, and so the um, AASLD criteria for the diagnosis is having two out of the following three. Um, biochemical evidence with an elevated alkaline phosphatase, uh, having a positive antimitochondrial antibody, or having a liver biopsy showing bile duct related inflammation and injury. So, Again, sometimes a, uh, a liver biopsy can, in a sense, break the tie if there's debate as to whether that's actually the condition. And the truth is that sometimes the condition can change over time, and you do need a, either a biopsy after treatment's begun or, again, um, at some point during your treatment. So um, who gets PBC? Well, there's a lot of estimates about how common it is, and it's generally described as more common in women by a factor of 10 to 1 but it does affect men. Um, and the incidence, uh, there's a huge variation in how often, in, in the frequency of the diagnosis. Um, somewhere between less than one person and six people per 100,000 people. Um, and the prevalence, as Dr. Veerling also alluded to, that's how many people in the population actually have it, is estimated between two and 40 people per 100,000 people. Um, classically, it occurs in non-Hispanic Caucasians, generally from a northern geography. But again, all of these are, are probably not necessarily applicable to everybody, um, meaning that um, this is sort of the classical description, but we're probably underestimating 
the number of people that are susceptible for it, and probably underestimating the number of men who have the disease or are susceptible. Um, and so, uh, right now, the standard of care for a PBC, and um, I think as of May 26, um, not necessarily in the future after uh, a beta colic acid was approved, but it's uh, urso, urso deoxycholic acid, which um, we heard earlier about uh, the, the uh, name of the beta colic acid being related to a goose. Urso is actually related to a bear. The, uh, it used to be derived from uh, bear bile, urso being Latin for bear. Um, what does uh, urso do? It improves the flow of bile, reducing inflammation and injury. It improves the alkaline phosphatase in bilirubin. It reduces progression to cirrhosis, and it improves transplant-free survival. Um, and it's taken every day for life. And again, we all know that this may change, but right now that's the standard. And, and some of you may be on this drug for the rest of your lives, um, depending upon what happens with how use of obeta-colic acid is implemented. Um, but even though the uh, uh, urso originated in bears, really the, the side effects are pretty mild. Um, they can be loose stools, weight gain, headaches, rarely numbness, Sometimes people even actually get pruritus as a result of Urso. Um, it does not effectively treat any other disease, although it is sometimes used, and there's nothing really wrong with using it for other diseases. Um, it's often used as an adjunct of treatment in uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, um, autoimmune hepatitis, and nonspecific elevations of bilirubin. Some people who have a problem with bile flow don't necessarily have PBC, uh, but they may have some sort of disease that causes bile to not flow that well. And so it's used in those cases, but it's not really the only thing that Urso is really FDA approved for the treatment of is PBC. Um, and the other important thing is that um, it does not treat PBC symptoms. Um, it, just, it just helps uh, improve survival uh, and helps reduce inflammation in the liver, but it doesn't really have a big impact on the symptoms of PBC. Um, the major one being fatigue, which you just heard a lot about earlier. It's common, again, a lot of this I know you've heard, but just to reiterate, it's common, it can be severe, it can fluctuate over time. Um, and, I, and I do think that, that it can, in itself, lead to depression. I just think that it's not necessarily the fatigue per se, but I just think having a disease that can be disabling, that it can sort of be a big factor in your life, uh, can cause a lot of distress. Um, but the fatigue itself is of unclear cause. Um, unfortunately, there are no effective treatments to completely eliminate fatigue. I know that in some people, uh, they have found a lot of relief with the available treatments, but um, it's hard to predict uh, an individual that will or won't respond. Um, I always think that it's important that in somebody who has fatigue to just review all of the medications, make sure that there's not another culprit that could be easily identified and changed. Um, you heard earlier that sometimes it's as simple as changing the beta blocker to, um, to, a, to taking it at night to help with uh, insomnia. And it's, it's little tricks like that that I think are important to make sure that your doctor is considering when treating fatigue. And I do think that it's also important to independently make sure that there is not also depression and to aggressively treat that if needed and to not assume that uh, depression is necessarily a manifestation of fatigue. Um, Itching, also very common, also a variable severity, also fluctuating over time, also of unknown cause, probably more related to the buildup of bile acids and tissues, as you've heard. Um, Urso, unfortunately, is not effective. Um, and um, as Dr. Vierling was alluding to earlier also, um, it can be a side effect of the abetacolic acid at the higher, at the higher doses, but fortunately, um, it doesn't look like those doses are going to be the ones that are required to get effective treatment for beta colic acid. So hopefully the future looks better uh, for this very uh, pervasive and frustrating symptom. Um, but effective treatments uh, for itching can include cholestyramine, although I have heard uh, patients of mine say that their itching actually gets worse with cholestyramine. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that. Um, rifampin can be effective, antihistamines. Um, there's even, uh, in extreme cases, there's plasmapheresis and nasobiliary drainage. I personally have never uh, seen anybody require uh, any of those extreme uh, treatments. And I've also never seen anybody um, uh, have such severe uh, itching because of Urso that they had to stop treatment. 
Um, and we'll hear more about uh, dry skin or, or eyes, but um, th those could also be a reflection of the fact that it is an autoimmune disease. Um, it does tend to affect women more than men, but again, it could just be a, fact, uh, a function of the fact that uh, more women are affected. Um, I, 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 I think that that's, it's fair to focus on that, but I, I just think that it's also important to realize that, that men can uh, suffer from this condition as well. Um, and, of course, uh, there is the issue of accelerated bone uh, loss and osteoporosis in PVC, which we'll also hear more about later. Um, and yellowing of the skin and eyes, um, you know, usually that does uh, reflect the fact that somebody has advanced liver disease. Every once in a while, somebody can present with jaundice, and um, it's because they, are, they have undiagnosed PVC, um, and usually those are the patients that get a liver biopsy, and sometimes they actually don't have uh, very advanced liver disease. They just needed to be treated or, or, they needed, or we needed to make sure that they didn't have a, 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 an obstruction of their bile duct. So again, I think it's important that, that if you do have any of these symptoms to just not assume the worst and to see a physician and make sure that you get care. Maybe this is how some of you first presented to your physician uh, is with noticing or somebody else noticing that you had yellowing of your skin or eyes. Um, another uh, thing that can happen, uh, especially with very advanced disease, is uh, esophageal varices. And that's a reflection of uh, impaired blood flow into the liver, um, usually but not always because of cirrhosis. Um, and uh, it can uh, be seen in PBC uh, even before cirrhosis uh, is known, um, although it's extremely rare. Um, there aren't any specific screening guidelines uh, in the PBC in PBC patients uh, for looking for varices. Um, some people say that um, if you if you have a risk score, the Mayo risk score greater than 4.1 or low platelets, that it's time to get screened for varices. I think the general rule of thumb is that um, if you have PBC and you have cirrhosis, you just need all of the sort of management that anyone with cirrhosis should have. Um, and, it's, and, and if you are found to have cirrhosis, the uh, treatment for that includes medications like a non-selective beta blocker like natalol or propranolol, um, having endoscopy to treat it, or having various other procedures that can bypass blood flow around the liver to reduce pressure in those blood vessels flowing to the liver. Um, and so other things that need to be monitored. Um, as, as was mentioned earlier, hypothyroid is, is an extremely important uh, component to monitor. Um, and um, also uh, fat-soluble uh, vitamins, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about that later, too. Um, the fat-soluble vitamins that are of particular importance, importance are vitamin A, D, E, and K. Um, and um, in a lot of parts of the world, uh, even Houston, and possibly even in Arizona, where I know I've met some of you, um, uh, even here, I'm actually found out that I was vitamin deficient. I think it's because it's just so hot and humid outside that we, we end up staying indoors. And so it's an extremely uh, important thing for uh, your physician to